Hey Teachable Tribe, um, Ashley Hockney over at Teachable, sitting down with Jesse Krieger. Um, Jesse, you wanna introduce yourself? Hey Ashley, hello everybody over there in Teachable land. Nice to meet you, I'm Jesse Krieger. Yes, and do you wanna tell people what you do for a living because it's pretty exciting. Sure. Uh, I run a publishing company called Lifestyle Entrepreneurs Press. You can see probably some of our books here uh, behind me. And, you know, we're sort of a modern publishing company in the sense that we work with authors, not just on making great looking books um, and getting those available wherever books are sold, but also actually doing promotion and doing book launches with and for authors, which, you know, from my experience is what authors are really looking for with a publisher anyways. Absolutely. And now Jesse has this business. He started his business and it certainly did not come out of a nine to five cubicle job. Do you want to tell people a little bit what that looked like for you starting out on your journey and how you got to where you are now? The truth is, Ashley, I don't know if I've ever actually had a traditional career path. Yeah. Um, very early in life, you know, my first passion was music, played electric guitar, I took that about as far as, uh, as one could. Yeah. First actual business was uh, at 21 years old, I created a record label mm -hmm. to sort of administer our band's career. And that was my introduction to entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um, through that filter of music, which was my then passion. You know, I think over the last 10, 11 years or so and the different businesses I've been involved in, mm -hmm that's been sort of consistent and more of used the thing that I'm interested in and passionate about as a forerunner for whatever type of way that I'll be making money. Yeah. And I find uh, myself pretty, pretty firmly committed to publishing and working with authors yeah. for the foreseeable future. So absolutely the benefit of being involved in a lot of different things is now I feel very certain uh, yeah. that I found the one that I really love. That's awesome. Cause you've done all of it really from a record studio, you've done coaching, um, and now you're doing publishing. What's been, I mean, publishing must be your favorite, but what have been the benefits of each really? Well, you know, through getting into business through mm -hmm. music, what I really, I think my main takeaway was marrying the creative and the commercial um, yeah. side of things. You know, I came into it really hard from the creative side and mm -hmm. you may know, or maybe some of the people that are creating you know, training on Teachable may, may also feel the same way as you're not totally like technical and business minded if you're like a teacher, a trainer, if you're in a uh, public performance type of space and mindset. So, you know, once I saw how business itself can be a creative act, I think I really got the bug. Right. And I think that's really true for course creators and both bloggers, content creators. You know, that does come from the sense of creativity. You want to create something beautiful, but then you have to figure out how to market it. And I think especially for authors, you know, you have the stereotype of the starving artist. That is pretty difficult. Um, so I kind of want to jump into, I know you have a summit coming up that touches exactly on that. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, the yeah. starving artist, I can't help but smile. Because you know, something I always say is if you tell yourself a better story, then you'll get yourself a better ending. And so if you've got this loop like, I'm a starving artist or I'm a poor author, yeah. then it's kind of a self-perpetuating um, situation to be to be honest so you know instead of you think you know I'm I'm an author I have a message and it can really move the needle for a lot of people or if it's fiction you know that you can provide entertainment and fun to a lot of people if yeah. that's your mindset going in then then hopefully that's more people's experience when they experience your your work your creativity your output yeah and I absolutely love that I mean I'm an English major myself I've run into a couple other of people who are English majors writers actors who have found themselves in similar positions where they're running businesses and doing marketing and that that stereotype is so frustrating because it doesn't have to be true yeah and in the author realm you know I found the number one concern hesitation yeah. that people have about really creating a book and finishing it it's what I call playing the waiting game and waiting uh -huh. being an acronym for who am I to? And as oh. long as authors are saying, who am I to put myself forward as an expert on this topic? Who am I to write a book about X, Y, Z? Then uh -huh. it presupposes a negative answer. And yeah. you know, the shift, the simple shift there is going from who am I to, to who can I serve? Who is this book for? Who is this going to, you know, make a difference yeah. in their life, solve a problem, or help them achieve a goal or aspiration, it takes the focus off of you, like, am I good enough? And it shifts it more onto the reader, 
which I think is where it should be. Absolutely. And is this something that you're going to talk about more in your summit or tell me a little bit about that? Um, because I know you're in the middle of it right now. I know everyone watching can join. Give us the deal. Yeah, sure. I mean, right now we're in the middle of the book business and brand building summit. It yeah. runs live June 20th to 30th. We've got live interviews every day as well as some pre-recorded interviews that become available on a rolling basis. I created this summit, Ashley, because you know, I think a lot of authors look at books in isolation. Yeah. So if, if I just get my book done, then everything will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. The reality is um, that, you know, there's a lot more that goes into really having um, yeah. a best-selling book, a, you know, a, a book that's well-received by the market, but also mm -hmm. a business that sort of grows and amplifies on that. Um, just for example, you know, I've sold thousands and thousands of my book, uh, yeah. Lifestyle Entrepreneur. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I've made thousands and thousands of dollars. And, yeah. you know, what is that? Ultimately, it's not a, a full time income. Now, from the opportunities that book has enabled training yeah. programs, live events, coaching, client done for you work, you know, well into the six figures. Yeah. And that's what I want to really be focusing on throughout the course of this summit is a bunch of different ways that best selling authors and entrepreneurs leverage books to build their business and brand. And of course, how viewers um, can sort of go through these proven strategies and pick the ones that really resonate for them. Cool. And I know that you've had not one, but two books end up on the bestseller list. How? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, without going way down a rabbit hole, I've yeah. got like a four or five year business history in Asia. Um, I've studied Chinese. I used to have a promotional products business that manufactured in South China and I did a lot of work over in that region. Yeah. So, you know, I first wrote the book that became Lifestyle Entrepreneur was focused on doing sort of a location independent physical products business. I got interest from a publisher in Asia in that region right. and they're like, this is good, but you know, why don't you broaden the scope and give us a little bit more um, holistic perspective on life and business. Cool. I rewrote it. That became Lifestyle Entrepreneur version one, which was released in Southeast nice. Asia, a publisher there. And, uh, and they really promoted it. Uh, and I was willing to fly over there and promote it too. And so it became a number two business bestseller in the whole country of Malaysia and it's distributed in Singapore. Yeah. Got to do like book tour over there and all that good stuff. It was really fun. I used that to build um, a case for my now US publisher, which is Morgan James publishing you know gotcha. fun fact I didn't actually self-publish my own book it yes. was through working with two different traditional publishers and seeing how that all works from the inside out that I saw the opportunity to create uh, the kind of publishing company I yeah. wish I had and that I thought should exist right um, but firsthand I mean to your question you know it's really a rewarding experience um, I had wanted to get down my philosophy on 10 mm -hmm. years of entrepreneurship working in very different and seemingly unrelated fields. Yeah. Just ask myself, you know, what is my approach and how can I get this down to help other people? What I didn't expect, which has probably been the most rewarding thing is the feedback that people have sent me. Okay. I mean, in the introduction to my book, I said, look, if you've learned something here, if this was valuable to you, write me. I put my personal email address in there. As so I'll get letters, even now, you know, years later, that say like, I found your book. I did, I got inspired. I quit my job. I did this. And now I'm like doing that and just like relate this whole story. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of amazing to think that, you know, if I hadn't written that book or for anybody that's watching this, that's an author, if you don't write that book and get it out there, it won't actually make the impact on people's lives. It has the potential to make. So that's been rewarding for me. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I can't imagine you're at the scale where you have a bestseller list. And I kind of feel the same way when I get like an email back that's like, hey, I like that, that one joke in your small newsletter. And, <laughs> you know, through this, you're actually able to change people's lives. Well, what we're both doing is, is communication uh, in, in some shape or form. And I really enjoy that feedback loop that is made possible through the internet, through different types of technology that are available. Mm -hmm. And you know, using those right, it's it's really cool yeah. how you can expand your overall reach from, uh, you know, I'm in my like home office, but I'm literally interviewing people all over the world and reaching people all over the world. 
it doesn't require getting on planes, trains, and automobiles as much as it used to. Yeah, no, it definitely doesn't. And one thing when we're always talking about courses here at Teachable, we always say they're scalable. Because sometimes when you try and build other businesses, it's like a blog, you're, you have to constantly generate content or, you know, to teach in person, you can't really teach thousands of people at once, you know, it just doesn't work like that. What has been your experience with online courses and online trainings? Well, first, I probably should have mentioned this up front. I'm very proud and happy to have Teachable as a sponsor on the Book Business and Brand Building Summit. And I really like what you guys are doing. And, uh, and, and I really mean that because, you know, one of the things that I really work with authors on is looking at their book as the basis for an online course. Because just having that, just that one simple thing in addition to your book gives you the multiplier effect of, you know, the potential to make hundreds of dollars per reader instead of you know twelve dollars if you self publish or one or two dollars if you traditionally publish. And you know, online training courses are a great way to deepen the level of engagement you have. I mean a book, sure you can sit there and read it and you feel like you know the author. In a training course, you're like watching them or you're live on a, a interactive call with them. And that really does something in terms of you know deepening the impact of the material. And I think online training courses are great in the sense that, you know, the way I define training is helping people go from point A to point B. Like yeah. In a book, I cover like philosophy, stories, some reference experiences, some how-to information. Mm -hmm. The training program, it's like, we're going to get you from here to having your book done and on the bestseller list. For example. Yeah. In the case, yeah. One of my cases. It's very tactical and practical and people value that higher than they do a book. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, you know? Um, as an English major, you know, I love reading books, but it's true. Everyone has this like different medium that they learn through. Well, I've always thought, um, Ashley, that a book has an incredibly skewed price to value ratio. Yeah. Right? You can pay $10, $12, $15 dollars for a book and it can actually change your life. And, you know, an online training course can too, but usually the ticket price is much higher. And I think yeah. that's appropriate. And I think it just speaks to why it's important to have um, yeah. a training course as an author. Yeah. And then I always, I just want to compare to like a university when you start comparing like an online course to a dev school to how much I paid a semester in college versus like an Ivy league school. And you're like, it adds well, up. that's a great comparison. Yeah. That's a really good comparison. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, if you just look at it in a vacuum and say, Oh my God, am I going to spend whatever on hundred, five hundred dollars to take this online training mm -hmm. course? And you just say, well, do I want to spend $500? It's not the same as saying, am I going to invest four years of my life and take out yeah. tens of thousands of dollars of student loans to not actually get tactical training, which yeah. in my experience, having gone to university as well, isn't what you learn there. Yeah. Oh, so absolutely. Some stuff, but, but not for that. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, and so for everyone watching this interview right now, they're probably feeling the same way. It's like you have this education, maybe we're all sitting in like nine to fives right now, we're all at jobs and we're looking to push beyond that and do more. Um, you've done that. You've had multiple, multiple businesses, you've been an entrepreneur your whole life. For that person who's just starting out, what would you tell them? Tell them a couple things. Uh, the yeah. first thing I would be is like, look, I don't want you to just watch this video and think that it's all easy and it's all butterflies mm -hmm. and rainbows. Start an online business and make money from home and change people's lives. That is true, but there's a lot of hustle, a lot of work that goes into it. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to learn a lot of skill sets and a lot of things that may be outside of your core area of competence. And in so doing, if you enjoy learning, it's a fun challenge. Uh, but you don't have to master all of them. So, you know, if you just get proficient and understand what all is involved, then it becomes much easier to bring on support, have a team. But if you're watching this and you're like thinking just getting started, I recommend um, what I call, you know, for a productivity technique, mm -hmm. one to two hours a week, sorry, one to two hours a day, three yeah. to four times a week, right? Yeah. So if you're, if you're looking to get rolling, just block out one to two hours a day, three to four times a week to have dedicated 100% focus time on your business venture. And that's yeah. something that's realistic, even if you have um, a full-time job. If you're doing that and you're taking the right mm -hmm. actions during those blocks of time, you'll start to build momentum. Yeah. And I promise that you'll probably start to allocate more time to your yeah. business as you see the beginning of things happening because it's going to be more exciting 
than yeah. your current state of work affairs. No, I, I love that. And um, I've recently done a couple interviews with some of our instructors who have just launched. They're very new. And one of them referred to their teachable subscription as like a gym membership. And they're like, I go, you know, and it was that same ratio, which is what made me think of it. It was like one to two hours a day, three to four days a week. And it forces you to create something and do something. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that people have a way to access all of the different you know, training or to put in the work to build out a course and get it in front of people. And it's, a, it's, an, it's another example of an incremental way to get yourself out there. Yeah. That, you know, especially with something like Teachable, mm -hmm. where you've got the platform. Like, I remember <laughs> learning how to build membership portals and set up all this stuff that I won't even name so that you don't get confused <laughs> about it. And it's so much easier if you can just have a process like what you guys have that just walks people through the creation and, uh, and distribution for their courses. So yeah. that, you know, same, it's honestly, it's a similar focus to my publishing work is I really, at the end of the day, want authors to be able to focus on being authors, mm -hmm. focus on being the exponent of their message, not becoming, you know, engineers and web developers and marketing strategists, right? So same thing, right? If you want to mm -hmm. teach, if you want to train, instead of going down the rabbit hole and learning all these technologies and all this complicated stuff, Mm -hmm. you've got a platform that lets people just, you know, get yeah. your content out there in a pretty streamlined way. So, yeah. So I'm really interested in that. Actually, how do you do that in your publishing business? How do, how are you different than the other average competitor? Sure. Well, one thing I would say is I actually don't look at any other authors or publishers as competitors because the okay. beautiful thing about books is that you don't just read one, right? It's not like, you yeah, out the right washer and dryer for you and then you use it for a decade people will read tens dozens hundreds of books you know in their lifetime and that's all good now the what we do that is different mm -hmm. is, you know one at this stage uh, I'm still personally involved with every author that I work with and we yeah. do str strategic consultation yeah. throughout right so we're yeah. looking at the book as one part of their overall business and brand even the book launch itself mm -hmm. is just one part in how you know, I like to help authors think of and structure their overall business's development. So let's say you've got an author that's got a, a live event coming up. Uh, we've done this on a couple occasions where we'll launch the book. The book has a very similar, if not the same name as their live event. And so you've got this two or three stage promotion where you're getting the book out with a wide distribution, hundreds, if not thousands of people. And then from that book, there's a call to action to learn more about a live event or to register to attend a live event so you can stack forward the interest that people have in the book, the content and the author into an interactive environment like a live event. So cool. that's just one example. And yeah. you know, with all the authors, I'll brainstorm and put out yeah. some ideas and find that higher level strategy that the book is one part of, but that ultimately yeah. is going to help move the needle forward for their business and brand. That's awesome. I guess also circles back to what we're doing on this summit for the next yeah. uh, week and a half. Yeah, totally. You know, for me, uh, part of my entrepreneurial tendency, I guess, is I love getting involved in every aspect of things. And mm -hmm. especially as, you know, as a somewhat smart person, you're yeah. able to figure out how to do a bunch of different stuff. Just because I'm able to figure it out doesn't mean that I should be the one to do it. And so the thing I've always struggled with uh, and I found a solution to now is, you know, how to really delegate and empower team members so that I actually take responsibilities off of my plate instead of like quasi delegate and then micromanage. Yeah. And I found the solution for that is to like with this summit, you know, I set a big goal. I had a big dream for it and it was big enough where there's no human way possible that I could do it all myself, even if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. so I think if you set a bit, I mean, my, uh, I would say, you know, if you find yourself micromanaging or, or get or mm -hmm. over busy or overworked, then you might need to up level your vision for what you want to accomplish so that yeah. other people can come on board with it. Like I've got a team of five people just for this summit. And some mm -hmm. of those people are in turn running their own teams, but I just deal with them. And, uh, and as we were talking, I think before this interview, you know, with uh, support, like, that's the one area I didn't, I didn't mm -hmm. hire in for. And now I'm getting like 350 to 400 emails a day Yeah. because I, when you register for the summit, I ask, 
in a quick follow-up email, what's your number one question or concern about yeah. books and getting it out there? And lo and behold, people are telling me their questions and concerns, which is great information. And I'm trying to respond to every single one. So it's a lot though. Right. So I guess the, the big thing, you know, I'm always struggling with where's the bottleneck and how can I create some system, some structure yeah. that lets that just work without me being in the middle of it. Yep. Um, Cause there's never going to be a shortage of things that I can do personally. And yeah. So like climbing up a ladder and, building the foundation for the wall up as you take each step higher and higher so that it's there to support you and you don't go all the way back down to ground floor. Yeah. That's so funny that you bring up that question as well. It used to be in our blog autoresponder. Tell me the one thing you're struggling with right now. And that was fine until our email list hit, you know, it was, I think at 30,000, we were like, we we can't do this anymore. And then we like launched an ebook and that email got resent out to everyone on our list. Um, which was actually, it was really insightful. It was nice. It took me like a a good day or two to sit down. And while I learned a lot, that isn't something you can sustainably do in your business day over day. Uh, I mean, well, I'll tell you, if anybody's curious, like what would I do differently? This is what I would do. I was just talking with my team about this. Yeah. I would still keep that question there. And I guess shout out to Ryan Levesque. He wrote a book called Ask. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, it's just, such a simple concept, but having that email in there is giving me feedback loop of what people really want to learn. So getting that before the summit even starts is helpful. Um, And having them continue to come in is helpful when I'm doing the live interviews. What I would do now is have uh, somebody on my team find like the top 20 recurring themes or questions that people are sending and then either create a video or do a live interactive hangout and go Mm -hmm. through all of them in a one to many format. Yeah. The thing I was really realizing responding to individual emails is sure, somebody's happy they get an email back from me, yeah. but nobody else is seeing it. Or yeah. I would put that, I'd put a link to some public space with like Facebook comments or something Click so I could it. answer them all. <laughs> yeah. And then people can see that I'm responding to hundreds and hundreds of questions. And I think that would, um, you know, yeah. either one of those would be a <laughs> more workable solution. Definitely. I love that scalability and figuring it out. Um, and I know a lot, all of us will run into this at some point in your business, you're going to hit a wall where you're like, I'm one person. Yeah. So it's really important because yeah. if you start to feel like overworked or overwhelmed, yeah. some people have a tendency to like shut down. But yeah. I say that's the, the signal. If you can get ahead of that a little bit, then you're even better shape to, to outsource, to delegate, to hire, to systematize yeah. that thing. Because we all still have the same amount of time in the day. What's the difference between someone that builds a multi-million or billion dollar company and a solopreneur who's working 12 hours a day? The person with the huge company has a team, right? Mm -hmm. And there's pretty clear lines of communication and responsibilities. So you can start to adopt that mindset even as uh, somebody who's just starting out. Yeah, I love that. I love that because so often, you know, we, we talk to those solopreneurs and this takes it to the next level. Cool. Yes. So. On that note, do you have any last bit of advice um, for someone before I let you go? Well, sure. If you're watching this and you're thinking about writing a book or you've been thinking about creating an online course, you feel compelled to do so, then you're meant to do it. And it's as simple as that. You don't need anybody else's permission. You don't need any market research or validation. You can be internally sourced in your motivation to create People like Teachable, companies like mine with uh, publishing are there to support that calling. And, you know, if you answer that call, then that's what's going to make the difference between the 70, 80% of people that say they want to write a book or think it would be a good idea and the what, like 1% that actually do. So, you know, don't, don't sit around waiting for somebody else to uh, give you the encouragement to do it. Or if you need that, then I'm telling it to you right now. Yeah.